The Golden Age of Air Travel, part two in our look at the Douglas Prop Airliners. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We're looking at the entire family of the DC airliners built by Douglas in Santa Monica, California. In part one, we covered the DC-1 to World War II, and I'll have a link to that uh, program for you at the end of this episode. Here is part two. We're going to cover the DC-4 to the DC-7. And in part three, we're going to look at the jet age, the DC-8 to the DC-10 and MD series of airplanes. When we last tuned in, we were looking at the C-54 Skymaster, which was the uh, four-engine prime air transport cargo aircraft in World War II. Uh, it was built by Douglas at Santa Monica. First flight was 1942. And this became kind of the backbone of uh, the global airlift uh, at the end of World War II and on into the Berlin airlift in 1948. The C-54 became the DC-4 airliner. There were 80 passenger DC-4s built at Santa Monica, like the ones you see here on the ramp and an additional 1,200 C-54 cargo transports were converted into DC-4 airliners by a number of aircraft manufacturers after the war. They were available uh, surplus for reasonable cost, and this became the, uh, the beginning of the four-engine <clears throat> fleet of many of the world's airlines. The DC-4 was known as a land plane. That's an odd term, but uh, it referred to the fact that uh, most of the long range travel before the war was done by flying boats that uh, went either to Europe or all throughout the Pacific. And uh, so to have a land plane uh, available was really kind of a breakthrough. But there was another one, a competitor from across town in Burbank, California, and that was the Lockheed Constellation, which also started as a, uh, an army uh, transport, the C-69, which you see here and later uh, became this 049 and 6 and 749 constellations. The Connie had a definite edge over the DC-4, however. It was almost 100 miles an hour faster and it was pressurized. But the DC-4 held its own. Uh, it had a crew of two pilots and one navigator, uh, usually two stewardesses on board. It carried 44 passengers, weighed 73,000 pounds at takeoff, was powered uh, by 1,450 horsepower Pratt & Whitney twin wasps. Maximum speed was 215 miles an hour. And it was used by, as I said, the world's airlines like Air France coming in here for a, a landing at Santa Monica on a test flight, but it had a 2,500 mile range and a service ceiling of 10,000 feet. The airplane was used throughout the world. It was also used in a movie. Uh, this is the uh, Transocean DC-4 taken at Oakland in a beautiful uh, William T. Larkins photograph. And this uh, became the airplane used in the movie The High and the Mighty with John Wayne and Robert Stack. And here's the famous scene where uh, John Wayne is about to slap some sense into a panicking uh, airline captain who was going to ditch this uh, uh, crippled airplane in the Pacific. And he literally slapped some sense into him, but that's another story. A derivation of the DC-4 is the Carver. Uh, this was built by aviation traders. It held uh, five cars uh, in the nose of the airplane and uh, up to 22 passengers in the rear part. So it was really the first uh, convertible freighter. And this was created by a gentleman named Freddie Laker who uh, later became known for Laker Airways. Now here's something you don't see every, uh, every day. Uh, a JATO assisted rocket blasted DC-3 on a test flight. But look carefully, this is a different type of DC-3. This is the uh, C-117D uh, Super DC-3 version. And this had a taller tail, upgraded engines, what they call the speed kit fairings for extra speed. And uh, at the end of the war, uh, this airplane was uh, intended to replace the original DC-3 as were many other designs. Uh, the airplane you're seeing here uh, November uh, 3000 uh, was Mr. Douglas's personal airplane. Uh, but again, it couldn't compete with the pressurized Convair uh, liner. This is uh, a 340 seen here. And the Convair liners kind of took over the market for the twin engine short and medium range trips. However, the DC 6 arrived 
Uh, first flight was 1946. You see here the mainliner 300 name on the United airplane, and that came from the speed of the airplane. It was uh, just over 300 miles an hour in cruise. Uh, had a range of 3,000 miles, but this was a pressurized airplane that could fly at 25,000 feet. Uh, there were 700 total DC-6s built. It uh, had two pilots, one flight engineer, one navigator, uh, two to three stewardesses, depending on the passenger configuration. It held up to 88 passengers in the high density, all coach uh, configuration. It weighed 107,000 pounds at takeoff, was powered by four R2800 Pratt & Whitney double WASP engines. And this is the secret to this airplane. Those engines were magic. What we see here is the uh, east ramp uh, with the famous compass rose there at the top at Santa Monica. And the airplane in the foreground is the named the Independence. This was built for Harry Truman. It is the first dedicated presidential aircraft ever built. Although President Roosevelt had a converted C-54 named the Sacred Cow. But the Independence was named for uh, President Truman's hometown in Missouri. And this served as uh, uh, theoretically the first Air Force One, although it never used that call sign. But uh, this was the first dedicated presidential airplane. And as we moved into the uh, early 1950s, we see all sorts of innovations like this uh, United Maintenance uh, Bay in San Francisco, where they could tow a DC-6 into a hangar and the work stands would then uh, uh, fold out from the ceiling and, uh, and surround the airplane, uh, alleviating the need for ladders and work stands and things of that nature. I love this photo. This is taken at LAX, and this is uh, a, a unique uh, baggage loading method in, a, in the forward cabin, uh, I guess for, for local shuttle service. This flew the airplane up to San Francisco quite a bit. And so um, uh, the equivalent of carry-on luggage, but uh, going in the forward uh, crew door. Uh, but let me uh, point out the size of the uh, pilots that you see there uh, standing next to the airplane and the tow tug. We're gonna be looking at this in a moment, uh, but just make note of the uh, scale of those uh, two uh, elements to the airplane. The DC-6B arrived in 1951. This was a stretched, uh, enlarged, uh, upgraded engine uh, version of the original six. Uh, it had two extra windows ahead of the wing, as you can see here. And uh, this is kind of a look at the future of air travel uh, at that time period as the uh, passengers deplane from their DC-6B mainliner and walk over to the uh, Los Angeles Airways helicopter, ready to whisk them to Disneyland and uh, points east. But the DC-6B really put this, uh, this airplane uh, into prominence. It was referred to lovingly by its pilots and by the whole com airline community as the thoroughbred. Reliable engines, good passenger load, uh, 3,000 mile range, 25,000 foot altitude, uh, just queen of the skies. And even in children's book of that, books of that era, uh, you see the Douglas liners featured uh, prominently. Uh, I had this book uh, as a young, uh, young boy and uh, it kind of inspired my, my love of airliners. But uh, I mention this because in the book, you've got this monstrous DC-6 uh, and then again, look at the uh, tow tug and the driver. Uh, I mean, this airplane's like 10 stories tall and 500 feet long. And I mean, it's just, you know, the monster giant of the skies. But believe it or not, life imitates art. So and just as the passengers were waving goodbye, uh, getting aboard the uh, airliner in the book, uh, here's a stewardess waving at the pilot of a Western DC-6B. Now, notice the square windows on the DC-6. It's a pressurized airplane, and no mention of Douglas prop liners would be complete without telling the story of the Capital Airlines and later PSA Airlines uh, DC-4s. Uh, the DC-4 had oval windows and was unpressurized. DC-6 had square windows and was pressurized. So someone in marketing got the bright idea that if you paint fake square windows around the oval windows of a DC-4, Passengers will think they're getting on a pressurized DC-6. I couldn't make this up if I tried. The DC-7 arrived in 1953. Here we see the delivery ceremony of the very first DC-7 to launch customer United Airlines. American was the other uh, launch customer. And uh, in the center there of the group of uh, executives, you see 
Pat Patterson, United CEO, holding a model of the Swallow biplane, the very first airplane United flew. Love this photo of a United uh, DC-7 on a test flight over LA. And um, I should mention uh, lovingly that uh, uh, the uh, uh, engines on the DC-7 were uh, 3,400 horsepower right uh, R3350 turbo compound radials. Uh, they were impressive. They gave the airplane a top speed of 355 miles an hour, the fastest of any of the prop liners, but they were problematic. And there were many airplanes that would land uh, with one prop feathered and be stranded somewhere in the world waiting for a spare engine. So the famous saying was that a DC-6 was a four engine airliner with three blade propellers and a DC-7 was many times a three engine airplane with four blade propellers. Now, how good were the pilots at Douglas? Well, here's a DC-7B returning from a test flight. If you look at the windsock at the right side of the photo, it's 90 degrees to the runway and it uh, looks like it's blowing about 15 to 18 knots. But look at this airplane. The right main gear is just kissing the runway. The nose wheel and the left mains are still off the ground. Perfect crosswind landing. And oh gosh, look at those, look at those flaps. That's like flaps 80, but uh, a beautiful piece of airmanship and uh, a good example of how good those guys were. So let's look at a DC-7 being rolled out of the factory. This is a factory fresh, brand new uh, Eastern DC-7B. It was called the Golden Falcon. Uh, went into service in 19, late 1955. And here it is on what they call the outfitting ramp. You notice that the windows are protected on the inside. They're covered up. They're putting in the uh, interior, the labs, the galleys are all being uh, finished uh, and the avionics and everything is uh, getting ready for, for the first flight of the airplane. And notice the uh, registration number. This is November 801 Delta, Eastern's first DC-7. We're gonna see why in a moment. Again, just uh, being ready for its first flight. Uh, 338 DC-7s were built, uh, it carried two pilots, one flight engineer, a navigator on an overseas flights, a radio operator, uh, two to three stewardesses, depending on the passenger configuration. It held up to 84 passengers and weighed 143,000 pounds at takeoff. So let's climb aboard and see what it's like to fly on a DC-7. Uh, you may remember I've mentioned uh, the story of my father taking a trip on a brand new Eastern Golden Falcon uh, 7B out of Miami back to New York uh, in uh, 1956. Look at this air, there's not a speck of oil on this airplane. It's perfect, it's pristine. And uh, guess what? It's the very first one, November 801 Delta that we saw on the ramp there in Santa Monica. So here we are in the first class lounge looking out at the horizontal stabilizer. And I love this photo. This is just a, a classic 1950s flying in a, an airliner uh, type image. But this brings us to the last of the breed of Douglas prop airliners, the seven C's. And that's a play on words. It's the DC seven C model. And uh, this became the world's first truly intercontinental airliner. Uh, it had a 4,000 mile range. As I said, 355 mile an hour top speed, 25,000 uh, foot uh, service ceiling. But this view gives us a really good example of uh, the differences uh, from the seven C's to the other models. It had a taller vertical stabilizer and the wings were extended uh, six feet on either side, which moved the uh, inboard engines further away from the cabin, giving the passengers a, a quieter, uh, more comfortable ride with less vibration. Uh, there was also additional fuel on what they called saddle tanks above the aft part of the engine nacelles. And that's what gave the seven C's its uh, distinctive look. Real queen of the skies, just a fabulous airplane. However, uh, the first flight was uh, December of 1955. It went into service in 1956 and it only had a two year service life because uh, this airplane kind of eclipsed the performance. Uh, the first jets uh, arrived in October, November of uh, 1958 and so by 1959, the 7C was no longer the, the front line, uh, main trunk line airliner uh, and was still flying, but uh, had a relatively short service life. The airplane that had the longest service life, the Thoroughbred, the DC-6B. DC-6Bs flew with United and American well into the 1960s. And uh, lo and behold, the longest serving airplane, 
uh, in uh, actual operational service was the DC-4 uh, for passenger flights. Uh, I flew on this very airplane in the Air Force in Japan uh, in 1969. Uh, this was the uh, Air America DC-4 that was tasked with flying uh, U US Air Force Security Service personnel all throughout the Pacific. A great ride, a full passenger interior. Uh, they always served a nice hot breakfast or lunch uh, on a pillow in your lap, and it was just uh, a real taste of uh, vintage airline flying. I kept waiting for John Wayne to stroll down the aisle whistling, but it was a great airplane. So uh, in closing, let's look at the progress made in the family of Douglas prop airliners. Here we have a 14 passenger DC-2. And then look at the interior of the DC-7. And this, by the way, is first class. Uh, it may come as a surprise. First class was in the rear part of the fuselage. Why? It was further away from the engines. So the uh, coach passengers had the wing and engines to deal with. And first class was in the uh, tail. Let's look at the cockpit design. Here's a DC-2. Uh, at the time, state of the art. But look at the DC-7. This is the captain's position, of course. But here's a look at the cockpit. And what you see on the left is called a radio rack. And uh, these were vacuum tube, uh, good old uh, 1950s radios. When there was a problem, uh, the mechanics would come on board. Uh, maintenance folks would uh, literally grab those handles you see there and lift the radio out and uh, replace it with a new unit. So in 1957, you had uh, Douglas airplanes all over the ramps of all the major airports in the world, but there was something on the horizon. Here we have Pat Patterson again with Mr. Douglas on the right. And you'll notice a model of the new DC-8 jetliner that was going to be the future of Douglas aircraft. And we'll look at the DC-8 and all the jets that came later in part three, which will be posted shortly. As always, special thanks to some good folks who allowed uh, the imagery uh, that we use here on the channel. We're very appreciative. We hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. Until next time, take care.